Debbie, time is 12 minutes past nine. You're under arrest on suspicion of murder. You don't anything for the mayhem defence. Don't mention one question. Something for the court. What do you mean? I'm just suspicion of murder. What do you mean? I'm just suspicion of murder. Stay sat there. What do you mean? I'm just in the coastal resort town of Bournemouth, a horrifying discovery set the community on edge. Amidst the tranquil waves and scenic views, the dismembered remains of a man were found scattered across the area. The body parts were crudely severed, indicating a lack of professional skill. As the investigation unfolded, a local couple were arrested, yet despite being in custody, both vehemently denied any involvement in the murder. Yet, they were secretly being recorded in the police van, and the man can be heard saying, kill, decapitate, and eat the effers. I'd do it again and again and again. Officers would later uncover that what they did with the remains were as vile as the murder itself. This case I found to be very depraved. The three people involved all live troubled lives, and I know that many others live like this as well. What happened was totally avoidable, but also desperate and brutal. But before we dive in, I want to let you know about my second channel called Grim Tales, where I'm covering true stories that are shocking but not murderous. I think if you find this content interesting, then you should see what's over there. Link to the channel is in the comments. And if you find this video interesting, then please drop it a like, as it really helps. Also, go here and subscribe to my Instagram. Thank you. This video is created solely for educational and documentary purposes. The dismembered remains were later identified as those of 49-year-old Simon Shotton, a man whose life had been troubled from an early age. Simon never settled into a stable career. Instead, he took on various roles, ranging from agency work and warehouse positions, to a stint working at a fairground. Despite the lack of stability in his career, family was a cornerstone of his life. He cherished his sons and his mother, striving to maintain contact with them, regardless of his circumstances. You see, Simon grappled with severe substance and alcohol addictions, which led him into a chaotic existence on the streets. His son Wesley, who was 19 at the time of Simon's murder, only spoke highly about his father. He said that although Simon wasn't always present, the moments they shared together were precious, often filled with motorsport activities. Simon tried to shield his family from his addictions and struggles. Motivated by his love for them, he made repeated attempts to overcome his dependencies. Throughout the investigation into Simon's death, he was consistently described as a kind and warm-hearted man. But despite his efforts to better himself, Simon's addictions drove him to commit crimes to support his habits. He accumulated debts with dealers and found himself in a vulnerable state, unemployed and penniless. Eventually, Simon resorted to acting as a mule, transporting substances across county lines, a role that paid only in the very substances he was trying to escape, making it even harder to remove himself from this way of life. Simon was eventually caught running as a mule and was sentenced to time in Norwich Prison. When Simon was released in September 2022, recognizing the dangers of his old environment, the probation services relocated him to Dorset in the southwest, hoping to distance him from his substance debt and the inevitable threats and temptations to reoffend. Initially, Simon lived on the streets, but soon found a precarious shelter in a derelict hotel. Despite this fresh start, he sadly relapsed and slipped back into his old life of crime. 
working as a mule, running lines and dealing on the streets for 12 hours at a time with substances as his only payment. Simon hid his new employment from the probation services, knowing that they would send him back to prison if they ever found out. His health was also in a sharp decline. He was exhausted from working the long hours. He was in physical pain all the time. He had COPD and he was not able to use his right arm properly. By August 2023, he was evicted from the hotel, pushing him to seek help from a couple he knew from his dealings. Benjamin Atkins, 49, and Debbie Pereira, 39. The couple lived together in a single flat that was rented by Debbie. All three of them shared severe substance and alcohol issues, and they began a sordid arrangement. Simon was allowed to sleep in a tent in the garden of the rented flat in exchange for £40 worth of substances daily. As part of the agreement, Simon had to leave the property during the day, but he was allowed to use the amenities in the evening, such as a shower and a bathroom and occasionally he was allowed to sleep on the sofa. This living situation was precarious at best. Three lives entwined by chaos and addiction, all under one small roof, creating a volatile mix that could only lead to disaster. And within two weeks, Simon would be brutally murdered. Like Simon, both Debbie and Ben had troubled pasts, Adopted by her aunt, Debbie grew up feeling unloved and overshadowed by her cousins. She felt that they received all the affection. Her stepfather subjected her to physical abuse and his friends intimately abused her. This type of relationship with men persisted as Debbie entered adulthood. She was in a series of toxic relationships where she was both physically and emotionally scarred. At 29, one of her partners introduced her to a brown substance, setting off a swift and devastating slide into addiction. Although she was a mother of two children, now aged 19 and 16, her interactions with them were infrequent and strained. Debbie had achieved sobriety, but she quickly relapsed when Benjamin Atkins, an ex-boyfriend, re-entered her life. The pair quickly descended back into addiction. Ben's own background was filled with violence. His stepfather routinely beat him severely, and during the rave scene of the 90s, he turned to hard substances, leading to addiction and criminal activities. However, following the death of his grandmother, Ben turned his life around. He got a trade as a carpenter and started to live a good life with a woman. But when his relationship ended whilst living in Bristol, his life began to crumble. He then got back in touch with his old flame Debbie and went to Bournemouth to visit her. Almost immediately, he had moved in with her. Ben, like Debbie, had children with whom he had little to no contact with. At the very beginning, the arrangement between the trio worked. Simon was in the garden at night and paid them in substances. Everyone seemed to benefit, but quickly things turned south. Not happy with just the substances, Ben began to borrow money from Simon, but he never paid it back. Instead, Debbie paid Simon back in order to keep the peace. There was also an emotional power play between the trio. Ben was often abusive towards Debbie and Simon would take great offense to this. Debbie would take the sympathy from Simon, but at the end of the day, she felt that her heart belonged to Ben and was using Simon as an emotional pillow. Not happy with the 40 pounds worth of substances a day, Ben started to blackmail Simon. He demanded more substances and also made sure Debbie did not find out. Ben told Simon that if he did not give him what he wanted, then he would tell the parole officers about his work as a mule. They both knew that if this happened, then Simon would be going back to prison. This manipulation and abuse 
only got worse. On the night of the 18th of August, Simon was texting his friend Donna. He was telling her that he did not feel safe at the flat and he needed a new place to stay. He also told her about the blackmail. All three of them were high on substances that evening and Ben and Debbie wanted more substances but they had no money to pay for them. So they formed a plan and Debbie would distract Simon whilst Ben went and stole his money. The plan worked and at 4.30 a.m. Ben and Debbie went off to get more substances. Simon quickly noticed that he had been robbed and was enraged and when Ben and Debbie returned home at around 7 a.m. Simon confronted them but Ben just laughed him off and he and Debbie went into their bedroom and did all the substances between themselves. Simon was anxiously waiting to be picked up for work. He sent a text message to his ride, urging them to come earlier as he felt unsafe in the flat. He knew something could go down. In his angry state, Simon also cut the TV cables in the flat and he went into the utility room to wait. No one knows for certain what happened next in the utility room, except for Ben, who claimed he acted in self-defense. It is speculated that Simon, perhaps anticipating trouble, might have used the same knife he used to cut the TV wires to arm himself against any potential threat from Ben. But this is only a guess. The physical evidence was telling blood spatter from both men was found on the walls and ceiling and both had defensive wounds on their hands suggesting a violent struggle first took place the confrontation escalated rapidly ben overpowered simon and once ben had the knife he began to swing ferociously simon had multiple defense stab wounds to his arms and his hands but eventually Ben was able to strike to kill. He stabbed Simon in the chest multiple times. Obviously in excruciating pain, Simon turned around to defend himself. But Ben continued and stabbed him in the back and shoulders with hard and deep strikes from the blade. Overcome by rage, Ben didn't stop there. After Simon fell to the floor, Ben continued his assault. While sat on his chest, Ben used a large speaker to brutally smash into Simon's skull. He did this repeatedly until there was no sign of life. In a gruesome final act of violence, once Simon was seemingly dead, Ben gouged out Simon's eye with his thumb. Debbie, who had hidden in the bedroom during the murder, came out only when the flat fell silent. As she entered the utility room, she found Ben still sitting on Simon's lifeless body. The scene was horrific and it was made worse when Ben turned around and looked at Debbie and said he's pissed himself. Neither Ben or Debbie thought to ring an ambulance. Simon was simply left for dead. What the couple did next was take Simon's pipe and smoke the remaining substances from inside it. After a few hours of being high in the front room and Simon's lifeless body laying in the utility room, the couple decided they needed to get more substances. Fueled by desperation and addiction, the couple rifled through Simon's belongings, taking the little money he had left. They also pawned Simon's bike and phone. The phone was unlocked by Debbie, who had figured out Simon's PIN code and re-registered it into her name in order to pawn it. They went back to the flat and got high again until the next day. It was only then, in the stark light of day, 
that they acknowledged the need to deal with Simon's body, which still remained untouched after the attack in the utility room. Ben dragged the body outside into the garden and covered it up. The couple then decided to go out and get some cleaning supplies and a hacksaw, all of which was stolen. Debbie had OCD and immediately she set about meticulously cleaning the flat. Her efforts were in sharp contrast to Ben's. Ben just painted over the blood stains on the walls with a magnolia paint that he had borrowed from a neighbour, attempting to cover up the visible evidence of their crime. Over the next few days, Debbie continued her thorough cleaning, while Ben took a more gruesome task upon himself. He acquired a book on anatomy and used it to guide him as he began the macabre process of dismembering Simon's body. He waited until it got dark, and in the garden, he gruesomely sawed off Simon's head, followed by his legs and then his arms. Ben was convinced that he could get rid of the evidence by simply burning it. Ben started a fire in the backyard and threw in Simon's clothes and his head. However, the burning flesh emitted a putrid smell that soon caught the neighbours' attention. The horrific stench was unlike anything they had smelled before, and they were horrified and became suspicious. Ben managed to convince them that the smell was that of a dead fox that he found in his garden and that he was simply burning the remains. He spent two futile days attempting to burn Simon's head, using various accelerants to intensify the fire, but the flames were never hot enough to fully consume the remains. Ben now had to think of a new plan to dispose of the body. On a rainy day in Bournemouth, Dana Burton was handing out flyers on the seafront when she sought shelter under a tree. As she stood there, a foul smell caught her attention and she noticed a suspicious package lying nearby. Her curiosity was piqued, but as the rain stopped, she continued handing out the flyers, but the package weighed heavily on her mind. Returning to the tree shortly after, she discovered, to her horror, that the package had slightly opened with the rain and contained what appeared to be a human foot. Panicked, she immediately contacted the police. Responding officers combed the area around the Manor Steps zigzag, a path leading to the beach, where they discovered another human leg. This grim find made the authorities do an extensive search of the surrounding areas. Six days later, in Boscombe Chin Gardens, a police officer, guided by a perverse and quote, smell of death, found a black suitcase containing a headless torso. Authorities were able to identify the remains as those of Simon Shotton. Further investigation led to a breakthrough when detectives traced the sale of Simon's phone back to a local pawn shop. This made Ben and Debbie the main suspects, as it was them who had sold the items. Authorities went to the flat to arrest the couple. Who is that? Right, Wait. Right. You're under arrest on suspicion of murder. You don't have to say anything about how defense don't mention when questioned something for a court. What do you mean? I'm just suspicion of murder. Evidence. What do you mean? I'm just suspicion of murder. Say sat there. What do you Go mean? I'm Officers found a smoking gun when they found Simon's severed arms inside two bin bags in the garden of the flat. They were both apprehended and put in the back of a police van. In the van, a secret microphone picked up their conversation. Do you regret anything? Debbie asked Ben. Ben replied, I'll look him straight in the eye and say yeah. I'll do it again and again and again. If you let me go today, I'd find another one and do it again. Substance dealers and pushers kill, decapitate and eat the fucker. Ben then spoke about the arrest in the garden. He said, and quote, I went into the garden to get rid of the fucking arms. Ben would also go to tell Debbie that he had cooked Simon's head and quote, ate his cheeks. Debbie would also mention that she was worried about the police finding blood under her fingernails. 
just showing her complete lack of remorse for the crimes. During interrogation, the officers wanted to know what had happened to Simon's head. Only small fragments were ever found. Ben said that he burned it in the garden and the skull and teeth turned to ash. But this has been proven to be impossible. To this day, Simon's head is still missing, denying him a proper burial. Ben asked his solicitor that if he admitted to eating Simon's head, would it get him off the hook? Of course not. The evidence was damning for both of them. In court, Ben was found guilty of murder, perverting the course of justice and preventing the burial of a corpse and was given a life sentence with a minimum term of 19 years. Debbie was sentenced to four years in prison after she was found guilty of perverting the course of justice, having already admitted to preventing the burial of a corpse. After sentencing, Ben said, I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't under the influence. I wouldn't have cut him up. I was scared. I was traumatized. I was panicked. I was under extreme stress, as well as under the influence. What I'd done was truly awful. It's horrendous what I have done, and I deserve to be punished for what I have done. I'm sorry to his family. I'm sorry to my family. It's difficult for me to be remorseful to a man who was trying to kill me in my own house. Simon's son Wesley said after the sentencing that his father's killers were evil, and he continued, and quote, Your children should be ashamed of what you have done. You wrecked many more lives than just my dad's. No sentence will ever be enough for what you have done. There is nothing I can say that can truly capture what you have left me feeling. You knew what you were doing. Whatever others may thought of him, he was my dad, loved beyond words and irreplaceable to me. I never liked the idea of dad being involved in substances. Despite his struggles, he was my dad, who I was proud of. I don't believe that Ben or Debbie are truly remorseful for what they did to Simon. I think they just seen him as an easy target to score more substances. And when he didn't do what they wanted, they just killed him. Tragic. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.